We touched on this uh, a little earlier with Federal Finance Minister Simon Birmingham, but Tasmanian Treasury releasing that paper yesterday suggesting the um, new GST arrangements from the Federal Government would see Tassie significantly worse off in the future. So joining us to discuss this is our resident economist, Saul Eslake. Saul, good morning. Welcome back to Tasmania Talks. Thank you for having me on again, Mike, and good morning to you too. Listen, this it, it's it's drastic. I mean, the spin is they're saying up to 20 to 27 and oh, there's an election then another. I mean, the spin is amazing, but from, from your perspective, can you explain what exactly these GST changes mean to all of us in Tasmania? Well, what these changes entail is a radical change to the principles that have been used to carve up whatever federal untied grants have been made to states and territories since the mid-1930s. And ironically, those principles were introduced after Western Australians voted two to one to secede from the Commonwealth at a referendum in 1933. And that principle, the fundamental one was that when the federal government is sharing out money with states and territories, it should share it out in such a way that each state or territory has the capacity to give its citizens similar standards of public services, schools, hospitals, police, housing, child protection and the like, without imposing vastly different rates of state taxation on the people who live in those states or territories. The technical word for this is called horizontal fiscal equalisation, but you don't really need to know that. Mm. And those principles were used, for example, when the Commonwealth took over income tax as a temporary wartime measure, they said at the time, in 1942, and shared some of the revenue that they got from income tax with the states and territories. And that continued all the way up until 2000 when the federal government introduced the GST and said it would replace the system of giving grants to the states with shares of the GST. And it was written into the legislation which states and territories agreed to at the time that the same principles that, you know, allowing each state and territory to provide roughly the same standard of services as the average of all of them, uh, would be the basis for sharing the GST revenue out. Then, uh, through no great effort on its own part, Western Australia started to become the richest state in the country. Because mining, of, uh, yeah. Mining boom. That's yep. right. Now, bear in mind that, as I said, the system was originally set up to placate the grievances that Western Australia had, legitimate grievances they were too, about the costs on them of joining the Australian Federation. And for almost 70 years... Western Australia had got a bigger share of whatever federal grants to the states were going around than they would have got if they'd been distributed on an equal per capita basis. But once Western Australia became the richest state in the country and richer than the rest of the country by a bigger margin than New South Wales or Victoria had ever been when they were the richest states in the country, Western Australia wanted the rules changed. They wanted to go to an equal per capita distribution, that is, if you've got 10% of the country's population, you get 10% of the money, irrespective of how rich you are, or something based on that. And successive Western Australian governments of both political persuasions uh, assumed that the logic, as they saw it, of their arguments for changes to the way GST revenues would be carved up uh, would eventually be accepted by a federal government and so they kept spending money that they didn't have and they ended up after the first mining boom with a humongous amount of debt. Then the Liberal Party lost office in 2018 at the state election in March of that year and shortly after that the federal government with Scott Morrison initially as treasurer and then subsequently as prime minister in effect imposed on all of the states and territories changes to the long-standing principles that were used for carving up the GST revenue that were designed to benefit Western Australia and in order to buttress that they 
commissioned a report by the Productivity Commission with terms of reference that were written in such a way that the Productivity Commission would recommend changes that WA wanted. You know, a classic example of the advice that Sir Humphrey Appleby in the British sitcom Yes, Prime Minister used to give to Prime Minister Jane Hacker. <laughs> mm. You never call an inquiry until you know what it's going to say. Exactly. This was an inquiry that was designed to produce recommendations that would benefit Western Australia at the expense of the rest of the country. I, if, I, if I might, if I might uh, so, so just put in, I mean, Malcolm Turnbull, I remember, wrote in his book, A Bigger Picture, that his successor, Scott Morrison, had a, and the words are, colourful row with Tasmanian Treasurer at the time, Peter Gutwin, and the language was quite strong. But if you look at earlier this month, New South Wales Treasurer Dominic uh, Perrottet had labelled WA Premier Mark McGowan the golem of Australian politics after the uh, latter state announced that record-breaking budget surplus, which was amazing. And this quote is, you can just picture him over there in his cave with his little precious, the GST. I mean, uh, it is a grave concern to Tasmania. When you think about it, when Treasury predicts that Tassie will be, what, $755 million worse off by 2031-32, which isn't really that far away. Well, that's right, and you know the the point. I, suppose, I, I guess this is what Federal Finance, Finance Minister Simon Birmingham was trying to say uh, earlier on your program that because it was pointed out at the time, including by our Premier Peter Gutwein, that all the other states would be worse off as a result of the changes that Scott Morrison was trying to foist on them at the behest of his mates in Western Australia, uh, that. The federal government then, in order to get the deal done, offered what he called a transitional guarantee that as the changes that were being made to benefit Western Australia were being phased in, the federal government would top up the GST pool so that no state or territory would be financially worse off until 2026, 27, mm. when the changes were fully phased in. Now, when they did this, they did it on the assumption that the iron ore price would stay at $55 a tonne and that it therefore wouldn't cost the federal government very much to honour this transitional guarantee because Western Australia's share of the GST would go up anyway as the iron ore price came down. I remember asking at the time the federal officials who were advising on how much all of this would cost. Well, have you thought about the possibility that the iron ore price might go up again as it had started to mm. do at that time and, you know, that kind of got brushed away. So what's happening and it's surprising that as Federal Finance Minister Simon Birmingham wasn't worried about this is that the federal government is having to increase its already humongous budget deficits by another 10 to $15 billion over the five, four years to 2024-25 in order to give that money to the only government in the country and one of very few in the world that is actually running budget surpluses. Mm. And 57.5 billion. Yeah, and you would think that Simon Birmingham, who is a South Australian senator, right, would be a bit concerned about what's going to happen to his state when Good call. the transitional Good call. guarantee mm. expires because after Tasmania... And the Northern Territory, South Australia, is more dependent on the GST share that it gets than any other state or territory. But it would assume, it would appear that Senator Birmingham is placing greater weight on his loyalty to his Prime Minister, who's imposed this deal at the behest of his mates in Western Australia, than he is to his own state. And if I were a South Australian voter, I'd be wanting to know, you know, why isn't Simon Birmingham as a Senator for South Australia, uh, you know, taking a tougher line on this? Absolutely. And, Good call. But just said, what you've said about, um, okay, um, no jurisdiction will be worse off until 26, 27. These changes introduced back in 2018. But then if you look ahead, and don't forget, we've all got kids here. In 2031 to 32, Tasmania is estimated to be, what, $100 million per annum worse off on an ongoing basis. So where are we going to get that from? You, we can't just say, oh, let's increase taxes here, there and everywhere. That's impossible. Well, that's one option that a government might be forced to consider. Another option is to cut spending by an equivalent amount. That means, you know, worse standards of schools, hospitals, police, yeah. public housing, child protection, what have you. Or maybe the idea is we can just add that amount to our debt each year on top of the debts that we're already going to have. Um, you know, I don't think we should be taking this sort of thing lying down. And there are some things that the state government, in not on its own, but in conjunction with other states who are similarly aggrieved, to be 
doing. Um, the first thing they ought to be doing, I think, is calling on the federal government to bring forward the inquiry by the Productivity Commission into this new system that is currently scheduled to take place in 2026. That is just before the transitional guarantee expires. Mm. They should be asking, or demanding even, that the federal government conduct that inquiry now. Uh, they should also be demanding a say on the terms of reference because one of the reasons that we're in this situation is that the federal government gave the Productivity Commission's last inquiry terms of reference that, as I said, were guaranteed to produce an outcome that Western Australia wanted. And the third thing they should be asking for is some say in who conducts the inquiry, because the inquiry which the Productivity Commission conducted was a very un-PC-like inquiry, if I can put it that way. Traditionally, the Productivity Commission has a strong record of independently evaluating the evidence on any question that's before it and basing its conclusions and recommendations on logic and evidence. Now, in this case, they didn't do that. Uh, for example, the Western Australians had long been arguing that the existing GST distribution system provided disincentives for states to undertake growth-enhancing reforms. And, you know, that's an argument that had been made by New South Wales and Victoria many years in a row. Interestingly, when Nick Greiner, a former Premier of New South Wales, mm. and John Brumby, a former Premier of Victoria, were asked by Wayne Swan, Treasurer in the previous Labor government, to investigate this, they at least had the intellectual integrity and honesty to admit that there was no evidence for the things that they had argued for when they were premiers of their states. The Productivity Commission also couldn't find any evidence to back up this assertion that the Western Australians had long been making, but instead of admitting, therefore, that there was no reason to recommend what the Western Australians were asking for, the Productivity Commission said, and I'm quoting them directly, the absence of evidence doesn't mean evidence of absence. And that's the same logic that George W. Bush Tony Blair and John Howard used to justify the erasion, invasion of Iraq in 2004. You know, they said even though we couldn't find any weapons of mass destruction in Saddam Hussein's arsenal, he must have them, so let's invade. And of course we know that what happened, the evidence, yeah. absence of evidence did in fact mean evidence of absence. You know, this is not the sort of thing that the Productivity Commission would normally have done, but they were clearly given writing instructions to produce a report that would give Western Australia what it wanted. They did it, and the other states and territories should not allow that to happen again. It's a, what, what does concern me, Saul, is the state already has choked emergency departments, lengthy elective surgery waiting lists, students struggle to meet average standards on reading, maths and science, and retention rates lag. I mean, that's something near and dear to your heart, I know. But in response to this report, Federal Treasurer Josh Frydenberg reiterated that no, and this is his quote, no state is worse off under reforms announced by the government to the GST in 2018. What was he reading, a little golden book? Well, no, what he was reading was what his predecessor and his current boss had said at the time. I mean, yes, it's true that no state or territory will be worse off until 2026-27. You know, that, that bit's right. But let's draw attention to two qualifications to that. One is that federal taxpayers... You know, irrespective of which state they live in, but that includes the roughly 200,000 federal taxpayers in Tasmania, they are worse off because either now or in the future, they're going to be paying more tax in order to pay off the additional 10 to $15 billion of debt that the federal government will be incurring in order to make sure that the states are no worse off until 2026, 27. That is just a repeat. The federal government is adding... 10 to $15 billion to the humongous deficits it's already running in order to give that money to the only government in the country that is running budget surpluses. So as federal treasurer, you know, someone who quite properly has said, you know, we've eventually got to get this debt down, mm. uh, the corrupt bargain which he inherited from his predecessor is making his job worse. But the second point is that what, Mr. Frydenberg said, only applies till 2026-27. And as things stand, from 2027-28 onwards, it will not be true to say that every state and territory is no worse off. They will be significantly worse off. And that's the point that the Tasmanian Treasury was making yesterday. It's a point that the Victorian Treasury made in its 
budget three or four months ago. It's a point that, as you said, the New South Wales Treasury and the Queensland Treasury and the Northern Territory and ACT Treasuries have all made. The South Australians have been a bit wussy about it, I have to admit, but maybe the inquiry that their Premier Steve Marshall has commissioned will uh, give them the sort of numbers that they can then talk about. Hopefully Simon Birmingham will be listening when he goes back to Adelaide and act in the interest of his own state rather than the federal government. But, you know, really this is an issue that's been bubbling away in the background. It's very complex. Mm. Not many people outside state treasuries and the Federal Grants Commission understand it, but it's enormously important and I don't think the Tasmanian government or the governments of the other eastern states and territories should be waiting until 2026. Oh, not at all. Not at all. I mean, even in state parliament uh, about WA surplus, I know the Premier has said he had grave concerns. I'd be probably wish he could really say what he thought, but um, his grave concerns will do about what would happen to Tasmania's share of GST after 2026-27. And he also said that Western Australia should be embarrassed, embarrassed off as a result of the revenues it's receiving. They were so embarrassed, Mike, that they resorted to a string of accounting devices to hide how big their surpluses would actually be. Now, as it happens, because the iron ore prices started to fall quite rapidly, you know, maybe some of that embarrassment will go away. But that just underscores something else about this deal that is outrageous, right? It is, from a Western Australian perspective, a deal that Xi Jinping, if he were the Premier of Western Australia rather than the President of China, would call a win-win outcome for Western Australia because it doesn't matter what happens to the iron ore price, Western Australia wins. If the iron ore price stays up, Western Australia gets to keep most of the squillions of dollars it rakes in as mining royalties without having a compensating reduction in the share of the GST. That wouldn't happen if the iron ore had been in New South Wales. You know, if the iron ore had been at Broken Hill rather than in the Pilbara, New South Wales would have lost most of the mining royalty revenue mm. that they would have then have collected in the form of a lower GST share. So if iron ore prices are high, WA wins. If the iron ore price goes down, then Western Australia's share of the GST goes up as it would have done under the old rules and will continue to do under the new rules. So there is a flaw under WA share below which it can't go, but there is no ceiling on it. And it's as just, I say, if you're a Western Australian, that's a oh, fabulous deal. Isn't it if ever. you're everyone else, for five years, if you're federal government, you have to pay for it. After 2026, 20, 27, all the eastern states and territories, taxpayers pay for it in either higher state taxes or lower quality and range of state public services or both or a higher level of... And you can understand, so why they want to be a a separate country in WA. Uh, Listen, we've run out of time, but it's a pleasure to speak with you and uh, Saul Eslake, our resident economist, about that GST issue. It is big. uh, We just need to be aware of it and continue arguing with governments in regard to it. It's just too... It's too strong a topic. And we need to be, Mike, if I can just say this, we need to be kicking heads. You yep. know, Peter Gutwein's a good well head said. kicker. He's been kicking the AFL's head and good on him for doing that. But our senators, you know, irrespective of which party they belong to, our members of the House of Representatives need to be standing up to people on their own side and standing up for their own state rather than hoping the problem will go away. Or else just tick you know, tick the box, oh, this is what we're going to say. You're, you're a senator for this party, so you'll say what I tell you to. Um, yeah, I think they should uh, exactly stand up for their state. Saul, a pleasure to speak with you again, and we'll talk soon. Thank you, Mike.